we're going to get started. So uh, we're coming actually toward the end of the class. Next week will be the last one. Um, and if you have um, any follow-up or additional things that you've thought of that you always wanted to know, I'll try to deal with them in the last session. Um, so send me a, an email before like Friday of this week and, and I'll try to uh, address it next week. But our topic tonight is uh, understanding services, the structure of the service and, and the prayers and so on. Um, but before we actually get into that, Bunny asked me so long ago to talk about the Star of David, and I'm just going to do it now because it seems like every session I never get to it. So we're going to do that Thank first, you. and then we'll do the understanding of services. So I think, she, you know, she, I don't know if you're getting into history or what, Bunny, but you wanted to know about the Star of David, and I wanted to start with the history. Uh, by the way, in Hebrew, it's called Magain. David, the shield of David, which may imply to some that, you know, did King David have this on his shield? Uh, well, we don't have any archaeological evidence of David at all, let alone his shield. So I don't know exactly how it got called Magain David. But most scholars think that it came, it started to be a Jewish symbol in the medieval period. And we don't have any proof of that really either of its first usage and origin. You know, I'm sure you know that it, it's used in other cultures too. It's not unique uh, to Judaism. But somehow it became the symbol for Judaism, um, probably in the Middle Ages. I think it's very likely that it was in contrast to the cross, that the cross represented Christianity. Christianity was becoming so dominant in the world the then known world or the then, uh, you know, the, the world that Jews lived in. And um, they needed a symbol and this maybe, you know, had started to be associated with Judaism and, and it was it, it was chosen. Um, what we do know for sure is that in the 17th century, the Jewish quarter of Vienna was marked with a hexagram to distinguish it from the rest of the city. And around this same time, the star also became part of synagogue architecture, both in Europe and in the Middle East and in North Africa. Um, and I'm sure many of you know that it was the star as a symbol of Judaism was further bolstered by the Zionist movement, choosing it as its symbol at the 1897 First World Zionist Congress. Um, it, in that way, it, the symbol got even more international prominence. Of course, tragically, in the 20th century, the star became even more evocative of Judaism when it was used by the Nazis to mark Jews for persecution. And then finally, after the Holocaust, the star, of course, as we know, became the, the center symbol of the flag of the State of Israel in 1948. And after that, it was you know, forever inextricably tied with Judaism. Um, but lest you think it's only from 1948 or forward, um, please note that on the bima at Beth Hillel Temple, front and center, is a Star of David, and the temple was completed in 1928. So that's 20 years before the founding of the State of Israel. Um, but after when the Zionist movement had chosen it and it was beginning to be used, as, as I said, in the um, 17th century already in, in synagogues around the world. Um, so any questions or comments on the Magain David and Bunny, did, did, was that enough of an answer to your question? Yes? Why? He's frozen. Uh -oh. Do the six points represent anything in particular? Well, funny you should ask that because um, it was, it, I'm sure a lot of other people have asked that and uh, I'm just shrinking my screen to see if I have my, um, I want to make sure that I've got my, oh, I do, uh, my internet on properly. Um, a fame, there's a famous 
work of Jewish philosophy by the 18th century philosopher Franz Rosenzweig, who called his magnum opus, um, is it called the Star of David? I may have the, the name quite wrong, a little bit wrong now, but he used the symbol of the Star of David to explain his whole philosophy of Judaism and how Judaism and Christianity interact. Um, the Star of Redemption, the Star of Redemption is what it's called. Um, but other than that, no, there's no particular symbolism to the six points okay. or the center or whatever. So Bunny, you were frozen when I asked, did you get your question answered? Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay, okay, good. All Am right. I still frozen? No, not right now. Anyway. Thank you. So now we're going to go back to understanding services. And let me go to presentation mode again here. Present. Okay. Um, so next slide. There's the Sidur, looks like kind of an, an older Sidur, maybe something like that, came to you and your family. Uh, you know, they found in grandpa's old possessions or something like that. Um, the, how did the prayer book as we know it today come to be? Um, so in ancient times, um, there was a customary set of daily prayers, they were recited by heart, or a reader would pray aloud and the congregation would respond to the blessings with amen, because everybody didn't have a siddur. Um, there were no books that contained the text of the prayers, and in fact, they didn't, in ancient, our ancient ancestors didn't think it was appropriate to write down prayers. They said that the writers of blessings are like those who burn the Torah, Writing down the text of the blessings was considered forbidden. You had to just know them or be able to repeat them, uh, but you couldn't have them written down. But after the Talmud was written down, that idea was abandoned and people started to write um, prayer books. And at first it was only permitted to use these prayer books in Babylonia, which was the center of Jewish life at this time, on the Day of Atonement or other fast days, not just for general use. But the famous rabbi Amram ben Sheshna Hagaon, the leader of the Talmudic Academy in Sura, that's the city in Babylon, finally wrote the first Siddur in 875 CE, so close to the year 900. And the Siddur that he wrote was specifically for scholars. Only the scholars had the prayer book. But one of his successors, the famous Sadia Gaon, finally compiled a Siddur for general use somewhere between 1882 and 942. So we're talking about late 9th century, early 10th century, the Siddur as we know it came into being. Now already at that time, you can imagine prayers were done orally. There were a variety of different traditions. They weren't all in every place that Jews lived saying the same prayers exactly the same way or in the same order. And so he, one of the things he did was to take the different traditions and to try to, and to, to weave them together into the form we now have it. Now keep in mind, this is the ninth and 10th centuries. There's no printing press, right? So every single Siddur was you know, handwritten, and there's no one original copy that we can point to and say, oh, this is Sadia Gaon's prayer book. Um, the earliest printed one is from 1486, and it was printed by the famous Sonsino family, which you may have noticed the name Sonsino, S-O-N-C-I-N-O. It's still in the Hertz Homage, I think it was done by Sonsino Press, um, there's still a Jewish publication society. Uh, so the Sonsino family you know, did the first printed Sidur, but it still was not mass produced like we, in you know, the way we understand Sidurs today. That didn't happen until the middle of the 19th century. 
So one of the things that we certainly know, even if you've been in a Jewish service one time, is that there's a lot of structure to a Jewish service. We always do things in a certain order, the same way every time, right? Or there's only slight differences every time. And this idea of fixed prayers in Hebrew is called keva. Um, and Jewish prayer is very keva based, very, it's very much of a fixed process. But interestingly, in the Mishnah, the rabbis wrote, don't make your prayer a fixed habit. And yet so many people, they know prayers by heart. They know the order by heart. You know, it's just all keva for me uh, memorization. It's very fixed. But ideally, the rabbis didn't want prayer to be that way. They wanted it to also there, to be parts of praying that was spontaneous. And the Hebrew word for spontaneous or heartfelt is Kavana. So, for example, if you ever go into a Christian place of worship, um, you won't find a prayer book in the pews. You'll find a hymnal so that, you know, they'll put up on the wall what hymns we're going to sing today so you can open up and see the words and the music, but there's no set order of prayer. Um, there may be in certain, you know, like there are certain memorized sections that people know and they always repeat. And it's, it's more so in certain branches of Christianity than others. But lots of times in, in a lot of the churches that I'm familiar with, a new program is created every Sunday for services because they're choosing different prayers and even writing prayers. And, um, but the things that would be fixed would be the certain brief memorized passages or um, whatever hymns are chosen for that morning. Whereas in our service, you come in and there's this giant book and there's, you know, a set group of prayers for Shabbat versus weekday versus evening versus morning, a whole set thing that when we take the Torah out that we always say the same things in a certain order. It's a very um, Keva based type of prayer. The roots for Jewish, go ahead, question. When I was um, going to the Lincolnwood congregation years ago, and it was conservative Orthodox, and everybody was doing their own thing. And to me, being reform, even though I was younger, it was like, oh my gosh, you know, because the person, even the women were doing their own thing. And then down below, the men were all at different davening points and different, and it was just True. mass. To me, it was mass crazy. It seemed totally disorganized, but in exactly. fact, they were all reading the exact same prayers in the exact same order, but they didn't have to do it as a group. They could all do okay. it on their own. And, you know, there'd be a point in time where everybody would kind of finish. They'd wait for people who were slower to finish, and then they'd all maybe sing one song in unison and then go okay. on in the next part like that. But so the, the, the prayer book has the keva, but they didn't require everybody to read in unison. That's very much a you know, the, the decorum type of prayer that we have in Reform Judaism is, is, is very much based on the Reform movement okay. in its early days consciously chose to have decorum in their services. And, you okay. know, for everybody to read together or let's stop and listen to the choir or what have you. So the roots of um, the structure of the prayers and the prayers that we say actually are found in the Mishnah. And a couple of sessions ago, we learned that the Mishnah is the earliest part of the Talmud. It was written down in 200 CE. And among the things that are mentioned in the Mishnah is, when, when do we recite the Shema? They discuss that in the Mishnah. They say that any, any prayer that, service that a Jew has should have 18 blessings. And to this day, we have a part of the service that's called the 18 or the Shemona Esrei, or that it's got other names, Tefillah, Amidah. We still have that part of the service. Um, and in fact, they call it in the Mishnah, they call it the Shemona Esrei, the 18, the Tefillah, the word that is used in our prayer book. Um, they also felt that the priestly benediction should be used in every service the threefold blood addiction where you usually you see me put up my hands and say that over someone at a special occasion. Um, 
and the beginning of the order of the Torah cycle is also discussed in the Mishnah. Now the practice of the public reading of Torah is already discussed in the Bible. In the book of Ezra, which is one of the very last books of the Bible, who lived from about 480 to 444 BCE, before zero, um, he came back with the exiles from Babylon and said, you know, we got we to gotta do a public reading of Torah here. Every, you know, and it, the, the idea of how it was done changed. It was a once a year thing initially. Um, but that concept of reading the, the Torah publicly is already in the Bible. But the cycle that we have, you know, which chapters, which week, you know, what the order is, what's special for a holiday, that is all from the um, rabbinic period. Um, so I'm going to go on, unless there's questions about that, to what that structure is. Any questions before I go on? So this is a handy dandy little cartoon schema that some of you I know have seen because I use this in other classes, so I apologize if it's a repeat for some people. Um, the cartoons are by uh, Jewish educator Joel Lurie Grishaver, and it's actually from a book that I use with the kids when they're in the bar mitzvah year uh, about what the main parts of the service are. So there's five main parts of the service, and I know you probably can't read the words here, but you don't really need all the little words. But there's, you can, hope you can see that it says there's a warm up, mm -hmm. and he has these, you know, a little cartoon with a guy lifting barbells, lifting weights for the warm up. Then there's the Shema and her brachot, her blessings. And that's designated by a person holding the finger up for one, God is one. And actually each of those other people represent parts of the, sh the, the blessings that go around the Shema, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Then the next part of the service is the tefillah that I just talked about, the, uh, or it's sometimes called the amida, which means standing. It's that part of the service where we spend, there are two parts where we stand quite a while, but in the traditional amida or amida or tefillah, you stand for, on Shabbat, seven prayers, and on weekdays for 19 prayers. Yes, the 18 at some point turned into 19 only on weekdays, but it's still called the 18, the Shemona Esrei. So Amida means standing, so that's why it has one of its names is Amida, and Tefillah means prayer. So it's the prayer, like this is the central section of the service. So they've got a person standing there with a prayer book. And then if it's a service with a Torah service in it, and you know that many services do not have a Torah reading, but if there is one, the Torah service is next. So they have the guy holding up the Torah. And then the, the end, they call the finale, uh, maybe closing sections, whatever. Um, and it's sort of the, you know, you know the service is coming to an end, right? When we get to Elenu and the Kaddish, of course, the announcements. Can't have a, a service end without the announcements and then some kind of a closing song or blessings to lead into uh, food if that's coming next. Now this structure, you know, like I said, it's not always in place because we don't read Torah at every service. Who knows traditionally when we do read Torah? Anybody know? You can open up your mic and talk. You have a minion? You have to have a minion, that is true. What else? Monday, <laughs> Monday, Thursday, and Shabbat, yeah. right? right? Monday, Thursday, and Shabbat. Any time on Shabbat? Uh, morning, and don't you also read the next portion in the afternoon if you do an afternoon service, like a yes. minute service? So traditionally, and by the way, Monday, Thursday also, just in the morning, traditionally, you only read Torah in the morning. There's a reform innovation to read Torah at night. Um, or on a special holiday like Simchat Torah. Um, so in a congregation where there's a weekday minion every single day, there's services, you would read Torah on Monday morning, Thursday morning, 
Shabbat morning, and Ben is right, on Shabbat afternoon before sunset, you already are anticipating the next Shabbat and you read from next, next week's uh, Torah portion. So, and also holidays, by the way, we'll add holidays to that again, only in the morning or afternoon service. And of course, we have an example of that in our own congregation. Even though we're reform and we don't have a weekday minion, on Yom Kippur, when we have services all day, we read Torah twice, right? We read it in the morning and then again, a different portion in the afternoon. Um, so some services go from warm up to Shema and its blessings to Amidah or Tefillah and then to the closing, right? And so oftentimes in our services on Friday night, if it's we have if we have services the next day, we don't read Torah. So we just have the four parts of the service. Um, if you've ever been at a weekday minion because of Shiva, it's first of all, it's in the evening, so you're not gonna read Torah. Um, and it would have these four parts. It would not have the Torah service. And then in addition, if you have a Mincha service, the afternoon one that we we our example is Yom Kippur afternoon, but it could be Shabbat afternoon. Um, believe it or not, there is no Shema and its blessings. I don't know if you've ever noticed that when we do Mincha on Yom Kippur, we start out with the Amidah and the Torah service. Um, we don't start out with the Shema and its blessing. We might have a couple of warm-ups before that, but that is not typically done in the afternoon. And that goes back to the Mishnah, which asked the question, when do we recite the Shema? And their answer was, we recite the Shema in the morning and in the evening, mm. but not in the afternoon. Um, so I'm trying to think what other... Uh, and also there are differences in... in subtle differences in evening and morning services, certain prayers change their words a little bit, depending on if it's the evening service or the morning service. And I'll talk more about that when I go through specifics on um, the Shema part of the service. But before I get to that, questions about this cartoon representation of the overall structure of the service. Growing up in a conservative congregation, when it came time for the Amida, everybody would stand and <laughs> silently. And what we did was you waited till the first person sat down and then everybody would sit down. And then the cantor or the rabbi, whoever was leading, would then go and basically repeat everything that we all read to ourselves. Yes. Why there, was that? There's a lot of repetition in, uh, sorry, I just had to look at my computer to see what time it was. I'll get this bigger again. Um, there's a lot of repetition in uh, traditional worship. And one of the things the reformers in the early days of reform Judaism got rid of was repetition because they felt, you know, why, why do we have to say things twice and three right. times? And, and, they, and people, you know what people do in a more conservative or orthodox synagogue, they don't even come for the whole service, right? Mm -hmm. How, yeah. You just get a few people there who commit to coming on time so you can start and everybody else comes late, like at the Torah service even. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they know it's, it's too long, you know, it's repetitious and it's too long. And so the reformers said, it's ridiculous. Why don't we just make it the size that people will come to and only do things once? And, you know, then they thought people would come to services, which I guess they did at one point in time. <laughs> um, but anyway, it was, it was to, you know, be more realistic about, okay. um, about services. So that it was the reader, everybody would do it silently first, right? Mm -hmm. And then the reader would do it out loud. And I suppose part of it is he, it was always a he, he is doing it on behalf of those who don't aren't able to do it okay you know so your average jew could just silently go through it himself or i guess in conservative maybe some herself but it would be done you know then the word for the person who leads service is shaliach tzibur which means emissary of the congregation 
So whoever's leading services is really saying the prayers for everybody else or for those, especially for those who can't say okay. them themselves. So I'm guessing that is the idea behind the repetition initially of the part you're talking about, but yeah. I could be wrong. That makes Other sense questions? though. It does make sense. Okay. I'm going to go on to the next slide, which you had a little preview there is actually I have the a windows on the south side of the sanctuary. Um, the other windows on the other side, I don't know if you've ever noticed, says the Shema. It's the Shema. Hear, O Israel. I think it says the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. And that is the central prayer of the next section of the service, but it has blessings that surround it. And so when these windows were commissioned, we decided to do the blessings that surround the Shema and the Shema is on the other side of the room. So um, you can go to our website and see the a detailed explanation of how this represents the Shema section of the service. I'll give you kind of a watered down version of it today. And the, it goes from right to left, you know, the Hebrew way. So you can probably see the Hebrew well enough on the far right. It says, Baruch Hu et Adonai HaMevorach, even though there's no vowels. Maybe you can make that out. That, those words are the beginning of the Shema and its blessing section of the service. And that window and the one next to it represent, or to the left of it, so there's the two on the far right, represent the first blessing that we say before, after the Baruch Hu and before we get to the Shema itself, which is blessing about creation. I'm going to come back to that, what that blessing actually is. The second two windows represent the second blessing that we say before we come to the Shema, and that is a blessing about revelation, God revealing the divine will to human beings. So, you know, the first two windows, it probably obvious that it's sort of creation of the universe. Um, the second two, maybe revelation isn't quite so obvious, but revelation means God communicating to human beings. So we chose God talking to Moses out of the burning bush and um, obviously Mount Sinai, the receiving of the commandments at Mount Sinai. That's the revelation prayer, the second blessing before the Shema. Then would come the Shema. And then the last two window, windows represent the third blessing, the only one after the Shema. And that is uh, the theme of redemption. So God redeeming or saving the world from its various problems and those who envision these windows came up with two representations of that. The first, a very modern one, the flame of remembrance and the ashes and the word Zahor to represent the Holocaust. And then that road leading to the creation of the state of Israel and the olive branches that's supposed to look like the Western Wall um, and the olive branches to represent the hope for the Jewish people and their safety and security and be able to create a new life in Israel. So that's one, one representation of redemption. And the second one, you know, obviously the, the rainbow and the dove represent the, um, the flood story, you know, when God chose to save the world from utter destruction and promised never to destroy the world again in a flood. But also the words there, Micha Mocha Ba'eli Madonai, those words close out the Shema and its blessings part of the service. And you probably, you may know that those words reflect the story of the parting of the Red Sea and God's saving the Jews from slavery and oppression in Egypt and the hope for all people to one day be free from oppression. So that window sort of serves double duty of the parting of the Red Sea and um, the, the flood story, the peace after the flood story. So this is the basic outline of that section of the service, the Shema and its blessings, that just to go back a second, 
is this section right here, right? You do a warm up and then you go into the Shema and its blessings. And um, now I'm going to do, I'm going to show you more of a, uh, a written um, chart that explains the same thing although it's going the English way from left to right instead of the Hebrew way from right to left. So um, this chart shows you, you know, the at the bottom, the sort of the mountain going up and with the climax at the Torah service is sort of the overall order of services, the opening prayers that are the warm up, the Shema and its blessings, um, the uh, Amida or Tefillah, the 18 that we'll talk about more silent prayer always before the Torah service then the Torah service if there is one and then the concluding parts Elenu Kaddish etc so then they've highlighted here what is the Shema and its blessings made up of so there's a Baruch a call to prayer and then those blessings I mentioned creation revelation then the Shema itself and redemption so let me go to those in detail now um, I'm going to go to call to worship first. So what you have here, this is not a Jewish guy, right? And that is not a temple. <laughs> See, it's not a temple. It's not a rabbi. <laughs> but what is that? Anyone know what that is? It's a um, the minaret. minaret. It's the minaret. And minaret. what is this guy doing up in the minaret? Yeah. It's, it's the call. It's the Muslim call to prayer. It's the Muslim call to prayer. Um, so Israel. he'll go up into the minaret and he'll say, Allahu Akbar, like that. You may have seen it in a movie or something. And then all the Muslims, they get out their prayer rugs wherever they are, right? And they put them down and they pray. So the Barhu is our call to worship. Um, so, but it's, you're already together. You're already in the synagogue uh, or by today and today, you might be on Zoom or on your couch watching a synagogue service. Um, but the leader of worship, whoever it is, calls the congregation to prayer. So that's what the Baruch Hu is. And by the way, I meant to say to you, if you have a Siddur, if you want to go run and get a Siddur, uh, you can sort of follow along with me. Um, I've see though that I failed to bring home my Shabbat Sidur. Do I have one here? No, I just have my festival Sidur. So I'm going to send you to a festival morning service to show you this. So if you happen to have a Sidur, you can go to 452. And if you ran to get yours and you have to have me repeat the page, no problem. See a couple people ran to get theirs. Um, so again, a Barahu, there are many in the prayer book, is on 452. This is in the uh, festival morning service. So the leader says, commands the congregation in essence, praise Adonai to whom praise is due forever. And the congregation responds, praise be Adonai to whom praise is due now and forever. So technically this is a call and response I know that sometimes we all sing it together, but technically it's a solo for the leader who is saying essentially what this guy is doing. Hey folks, it's time to pray. And the congregation responds by saying, we're, we're praying. But it's not just, hey folks, it's folks, it's time to bless God. And the people respond by blessing God. They don't get out a prayer rug. They don't lie down on the floor, but that's our call to worship. It's essentially the same thing as um, what the Muslims do so publicly from their prayer towers. Questions before I go on to the, the first prayer after the Barahu? Do you know, did that come from, do they take that from Judaism? Like, did they adopt that from Judaism? Do you know? You know, it's a, it's hard to answer that question because yes, Islam and Christianity are later than Judaism, but um, Islam says that everything they do was revealed to Muhammad in the Quran. And some of the things in the Quran sound a lot like mm -hmm. Jewish stuff, Jewish stories. A lot of them are sort of reworkings of Jewish stories. But 
to them, it's their unique revelation from God. So, you know, there's a lot of echoes in Christian worship, too, of what Jews do. Um, but I don't know if it's fair to say that they took it from us. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Or adopted. I, I really thought maybe like adopted. They adapted it or adopted yeah. it. Yeah. Um, yeah. We were at a funeral on Saturday and they did communion. And when they read, holy, 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 I did everything I could not to go up on my toes because it's the Gnutra. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're using the same holy text, especially in Christianity right. and Judaism. Right. Many times we're using the same texts, uh, especially Psalms, you know, right. we, we both use in our worship. Uh, but obviously that passage from Isaiah too. The Quran, th there's this different, but there are a lot of echoes of yeah. what Judaism and Christianity do. Um, so the first blessing then, question? Was there a question? Yeah, I have a, I have a question. Yeah. Um, was there ever a time, like in the ancient ancient times, where they think that Jews maybe did put down a, a, a rug and and prostrate themselves on the on the floor? Yeah, didn't did we didn't we talk about that or was yeah, that another class? Yeah, about yeah. how we used to, you know, the the word in the Alenu va'anachnu korim, we bend the knee umishtachavim, literally means to lie prostrate. Yeah. But well, at was, some point, the, it was decided that wasn't appropriate for Jews to do, and so they stopped doing it. I, I, I was just wondering if they ever, like in the Middle East, or, you know, if that was had been a I, Not that I know of. And, and there's no prayer tower in Judaism that I've ever heard of either. Okay. That public yeah. calling of people to prayer. I wanted to, I have one other question about the, uh, the subject before this one about um, reading the Torah, that the reform movement, we read it on Friday night, but in other movements, they only read it in the morning. Yeah. So I was just wondering a little bit about how that happened. Okay, good. I'm glad you came back to that because I meant to talk about it. Um, so this is really an American innovation. Um, in America, around the turn of the century, when from the, from the, 1900s to the 2000s to, to the you know the 20th century um, was which is when Reform Judaism really began to grow and flourish in the United States. Um, many many Jews were in retail business. They were they were merchants. They they sold stuff. They bought stuff. They sold stuff. And uh, this was very true in Kenosha too. That in order to stay in business and to uh, you know make a living, Friday night was a very important time to be open. A lot of shopping went on on Friday night. And so they made an accommodation, and, and Saturday morning, of course, too. Saturday morning, you couldn't close your store on Saturday morning and make it, or all day on Saturday and make it. So they made an accommodation. They said, we'll have a late Friday night service and I, I don't know how late was late at Beth Hillel, but it may have been 8.30 at one time. Then it went to 8. By the time I got there, it was 7.30. You know, we just kept making it earlier because we were trying to accommodate those in business who were open Friday night and Saturday. And, um, you know, unfortunately, the Saturday morning service almost disappeared in Reform Judaism, except for B'nai Mitzvah. In some places, that's still true. Um, but it, the tradition of only reading Torah on uh, Saturday came back in recent decades. So the question was, well, are we not going to read Torah because we don't have services on Saturday and we only have this late night service on Friday? Then we'll never read Torah. And they decided that it was more important to read Torah every week than to do it at the right time of day. And so they, they created this idea of reading Torah on Friday night. Um, and it's, it's kind of gone by the wayside now because congregations tend to have more Saturday morning services, but, um, and it never caught on in any other branch of Judaism. It was only a reform thing. So we, we now only have two Friday nights left where Torah is read, but some congregations, reform congregations, a lot of them never read Torah on Friday night anymore. Interesting. Thank you. Mm-hmm.
Anything else before I go on to the first blessing after the Barhu? So if you'll go to page 454, and for this, I'm going to go back to uh, the windows. So it's blessing number one here on this chart, and then it's uh, these two windows. Um, that is our Beth Hillel depiction of it. This prayer that in the morning, we're in a morning service now, is Yotzer Or Uvo Rei Choshech. We call it Yotzer Or. In the evening, in that same spot, is Ma'ariv Aravi. But they are both prayers about thanking God for creation and especially for creating light and darkness. The morning one, you can see here, I'll just read it out loud for those who don't have the Siddur. Praised are you, Adonai, our God, sovereign of the universe, creator of light and darkness, who makes peace and fashions all things. In mercy, you illumine the world and those who live upon it. In your goodness, you daily renew creation. How numerous are your works, Adonai. In wisdom, you formed them all, filling the earth with your creatures. Be praised, Adonai, our God, for the excellent work of your hands, for the lights you created. May they glorify you. Shine a new light upon Zion that we may, that we may, that we all may swiftly merit its radiance. Praised are you, Adonai, creator of the heavenly lights. So there was a tradition that after the Baruch Hu, the first blessing before reciting the Shema, our declaration of faith in God, you should always praise God for creation. But apparently there were two different versions of the prayer. This one that I just read you, and a different one, if you want to look at it in the book, 396, that is the same idea about thanking God for creation and light and darkness, but this one is more focused on the heavenly bodies that you see in the night sky. Praised are you, Adonai, our God, ruler of the universe, who speaks the evening into being, skillfully opens the gates, thoughtfully alters the time and changes the seasons and arranges the stars in their heavenly courses according to plan. You are creator of day and night, rolling light away from darkness and darkness from light, transforming day into night and distinguishing one from the other. It's more focused on night. And so this is the role that I think the original, uh, that original person, Sadia Gaon, who put the Siddur in the form that we know it right now, he played a role of, oh, there's this prayer for creation and there's that prayer for creation. We don't want to leave either one out. Let's just put them both in. We'll put one in the evening service. We'll put one in the morning service. The one more focused on the stars and the constellations at night. The one that focuses more on illumining the sun, illuminating the day uh, in the morning. So before we say the Shema and we declare our faith in one God, we, we are blessing God for the things that help us appreciate what God is to us. And the first of these is that is the created world that we live in. The second prayer, and again, you can see it on the, uh, oops, not that chart, this chart, blessing number two, before the Shema. Oops is represented by these two windows. Remember I said before it's about revelation. So if you look on page 456 in the festival morning service, and this will be the same in the Shabbat service, we have Ahava Rabbah in the morning. In the evening it's a little different, Ahavat Olam, but it's the same basic concept. Again, there were two different versions of this prayer. They both got put in the prayer book, one in the evening, one in the morning. But they both basically say that God loved us, so God gave us the Torah to help us learn how to live our lives. So this one is, how deeply you have loved us, Adonai, our God, gracing us with surpassing compassion. On account of our forebears, whose trust led you to teach them the laws of life, be gracious to us, teaching us as well. O merciful one, have mercy on us by making us able to understand and discern, to heed, learn, and teach and lovingly to perform, observe, perform, and fulfill all that is in your Torah. Enlighten our eyes with your Torah. Help us, you know, study it and with love, etc., etc. 
So both of these prayers, whether it's the evening version or the morning version, are saying, God, we, we thank you for loving us enough to give us your word, to re for revealing your word to us. And now we're, the prayer part of it, the ask is, help us now to be able to understand it, to learn it, to teach it to others, and of course, above all, to do it to observe, perform, and fulfill everything that is in there. So before we say the Shema and we declare our faith in God, we thank God for creation, and we thank God for revealing Torah to us so we know how to live our lives. Okay. Then we say the Shema. So that's not in the windows, right? But we'll go back to the... Whoops, keep forgetting what order they're in. Um, it says, Shema, three biblical readings. Well, yes, in traditional Judaism, it's three biblical readings. In ours, it's like one and a half, uh, or maybe one and three-fourths or something. So if you go to page 458, you'll find in 459, of course, you find the big, if you can see me in your my square, you'll see the big fancy Shema page which is um, in our prayer book that's the only prayer book that has it like that the writers of this prayer book decided to really highlight the Shema this is where we declare our faith in God hear O Israel Adonai is our God Adonai is one and then the blessing after blessed is God's glorious majesty forever and ever that is just part of the Shema that is not the whole Shema in spite of the fancy uh, emphasis that it was given in Mishkan Tefillah. If you go to the next page, 460, you've got m more of the traditional three biblical readings. The, what we usually call Ve'ahavta is really part and parcel of Shema. We were talking another time about prayer choreography and about how um, people who are really purists believe that you should not sit down after the Shema. You should because it's all part of the Vahapta is part of it. You should stand through the whole thing. But for whatever reason in Reform Judaism, we all got used to sitting down after the Shema. And I, you know, we do the Vahapta a lot only in Hebrew. But I think it's important to focus in on the English. You shall love Adonai with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Take to heart these instructions which I charge you this day. Impress them upon your children. Recite them when you stay at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them serve as a symbol on your forehead. Inscribe them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And if you look below in Mishkan Tefillah, one of the nice things about Mishkan Tefillah is it gives you sources when something comes out of a text in the Bible. And it tells you that um, the Ahavta, up to that point that I just read, is from Deuteronomy chapter 6. So is the, the, the Shema Yisrael, by the way. But the next part, that we just go on as if they're one big paragraph, Lama Antiz Karu, is from Numbers chapter 15. Thus you shall remember and observe all my commandments and be holy to your God. I am Adonai your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am Adonai your God. So the reformers took out um, part of this Numbers passage and all of another passage that, which um, by the way, you can see part of on page 462 um, because they put it back in the festival service here uh, and also in the Shabbat morning service. It says below here also from, this is, this is the part they took out of Numbers 15. It talks about wearing the fringes on a talit. So this gets back into what the reformers took out. They took this out because if you grew up in Reform Judaism 30, 40, 50 years ago, there were no talitot. Only the rabbi maybe wore a talit, some form of a talit. Nobody wore a talit. And so they, they said, we're not going to wear that old fashioned prayer garb. So why are we talking about it when we say the Shema? We're taking it out. And then there's another paragraph that it didn't make it back into the this prayer book. 
that is a passage in Deuteronomy that says, if you follow the commandments and um, walk in God's ways, you will get rain in the proper season, you, your crops will be bountiful, and your enemies will run away from you. But if you don't follow the commandments, you will, there will be a, you know, the skies will close up, there won't be any rain, there'll be a terrible drought, you won't have any crops, and your enemies will pursue you and, and defeat you. And um, the reformers also were very interested in mean, saying what they meant and, mean, and, and meaning what they said. So they didn't want to say things they didn't believe, and they did not believe in this um, idea of reward and punishment, that if you're good, you always get rewarded, and if you're bad, you get punished. They didn't see their world that way, and so they took that out of the Shema. But originally, those were the three biblical readings that were part of the Shema, and we just have part of it left in our prayer book. Um, let me quickly go to the last, uh, the, one, the one reading that we do after, and then I'll open it up for questions. Blessing number three here in the, in the outline of the Shema and then in the windows, uh, it's these two. The redemption windows was how we chose to depict it. This you are familiar with as Micha Mocha, page um, 466. But really that's just the end of the this redemption blessing. It really starts on page 464. And we rarely read this we never read the whole thing in Hebrew, at least in our congregation. Maybe there are Reformed congregations that do. We usually read a passage in English and then the Micha Mocha part of it. And you may be aware that there's a morning and evening Micha Mocha too, just like the others. There were different traditions. They put one in the evening and one in the morning, so they were both preserved. Um, but if you, just to look at the translation on 464, uh, for us, this eternal teaching is true, and that's true as the word emet, up in blue in the upper red, the upper right corner. And you may have heard people, after they finish chanting the Ahavta, say emet. It's the first word of the next prayer. So for us, this eternal teaching is true and enduring, beloved and precious, awesome, good and beautiful. The God of the universe is truly our sovereign, the rock of Jacob, our protecting shield. God endures through all generations. God's name persists. God's throat is firm. God's sovereignty and faithfulness last forever. God's word live and endure faithful and precious for eternity. And then it gets into the reliving the Egypt moment in Egypt. From Egypt you redeemed us, freeing us from bondage. For that your beloved sang praise, exalting you. Your dear ones offered hymns, songs, praise, blessing, and thanksgiving to you as sovereign the living and enduring God, high and exalted, great and awesome God ever humbles the proud, raises the lowly, frees the imprisoned, redeems the afflicted, helps the oppressed, answering our people when we cry out. Praise to God most high, blessed is God and deserving of blessing. In great joy, Moses, Miriam, and Israel responded with song to you, all of them proclaiming, and then on 466, who is like you, O God, among all the gods that are worshipped? You saved us, you know, just summarizing here. You saved us at the shores of the sea. You redeemed us. So that's the um, third prayer, the, but the only one after the Shema. And it has the theme of revelation. So, I mean, excuse me, redemption. So I'm going to stop there and see if there are questions before I talk anymore. Some of you asked for this, you know, clarification of the structure and the uh, meaning of the prayers. I hope it's that's what you were looking for. I mean, I've done a whole class on this that was several weeks long. So, you know, it's just kind of a... Um, a little mini version of it, but very quickly, what Bunny was saying about uh, in the synagogue where there were everyone was like at their own pace, and everyone was doing their own thing. When I was in Israel, one morning I went to the wall, and the same thing. You have everybody doing their own thing, and the group I was with, the rabbi said, you know, do your own thing, but just kind of listen because you want to get to around this, be around the same point. So here I am with my Mishkan Tefillah. Everyone else has their art scroll there, you know, Orthodox, <laughs> yet. 
we got to the same point for the priestly benediction very close to the same point even though i was doing my reform version and they were doing their orthodox we still got there right around the same point that's one of the nice things about mishkan tefillah if you want to pray you know pretty much a traditional service you can with it right. which was not true of the earlier versions of our sidur of a reform sidur it was so modified that it wasn't it wasn't really an approximation of the traditional sidur anymore now someone who's orthodox looking at it might say well that's not the sidur but it does have all the traditional elements in it all granted mm -hmm. there are sections that we still yanked out of there that sure. are missing is, anyway. is the is the conservative sidur more like the reform or more like the orthodox it's more like the Orthodox, but they've modified it a lot. And I, I, I could be wrong, but it seems like they modeled their latest Sidur a lot after Mishkan Tefillah with lots of choice in it. I haven't actually seen it, but I, I've heard it's really terrific. It has lots of, you know, alternative readings and things in it, but all of the traditional uh, prayers are there and it's much more, a conservative service is much more like a, a Orthodox service than reform, I would say. In Mishkan Tefillah, when we went to that at Amachad, going from conservative to reform, and that's when it first came out, we were very comfortable with it because it had so many more of the traditional elements to it versus the old gates of a prayer that was more abbreviated in a lot of things. And the reform and the reconstructionists were the first to put the imahot, the mothers in, and change the language in English to make the wording for God more neutral, and, and the conservative movement has followed suit in those areas too. Anything else? So we are going to do more of the prayer service next week. We're going to particularly talk about the tefillah, that, that main section of the service with the 18 prayers um, on, um, uh, on weekdays. It has all 18, but not on Shabbat. So, um, But also I wanted to reiterate that if you have anything else that was one of your everything you always wanted to know things, uh, email me this week and I'll try to include those as well. That'll be our last session. Okay. Thanks, everybody. I, you listened to me talk a lot tonight, so sorry about that. But <laughs> learned a lot, as always. <laughs> no, very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.